welcome to the pseudo show this is brandon we're back i know we've been off of the air for a few months the pseudo show is back just uh released several videos for pseudo show labs the first one was essentially an unboxing of the thinkstation 360 ultra workstation a video that was published last week was for crowdsec and there is some upcoming content for pseudo show labs around free ipa and as you'll hear at the end of this uh we're gonna be it may either be a live stream or or just uh, a completely unedited discussion that will be on youtube and we're gonna whiteboard a few solutions on uh on the youtube channel on this episode neil and bill who have been on the show before they are now recurring guest hosts we got together to discuss Linux on the desktop. We recorded this in early September. There was an article that came out in the register essentially saying that every enterprise should ditch Windows and move to Linux. The discussion essentially came down to, we can do it, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done before that can happen. I feel like Neil, Bill and I had a really good discussion here. I hope you enjoy it. So here is Linux on the Desktop, Pseudo Show, Episode 54. Today's episode is brought to you by Bitwarden. Bitwarden is the easiest way for individuals, teams, and business organizations to store, share, and sync sensitive data. Bitwarden is an open source password management tool whose feature set rivals any other tool on the market today. Not only is Bitwarden open source, it is regularly audited by security professionals. You can get started for free at bitwarden.com slash tux and plans start at just $10 per year. Thank you to Bitwarden for sponsoring the Pseudo Show. This episode of the Pseudo Show is brought to you by DigitalOcean. Head on over to do.co slash tux2022 to get started with a $100 credit. DigitalOcean has a comprehensive portfolio of cloud infrastructure so you and your teams can get back to doing what matters most, building apps that grow your business. With predictable pricing and robust product documentation, get support at every stage of growth with simple, powerful cloud computing. As a listener of the Pseudo Show and a member of the Tux Digital community, you can get started for free. In fact, it's better than free because DigitalOcean is giving you a $100 credit when you sign up at do.co slash touch2022. We want to thank DigitalOcean for sponsoring this episode of The Pseudo Show. Joining me today on The Pseudo Show, our favorite recurring guest hosts, Bill and Neil. We're going to talk about this uh, notion that came out on the register now a few weeks ago about you know, businesses just switch from Windows to Linux, acting as if it's a no-brainer. And this partly came out because GitLab has their company policies posted publicly on the internet. And, and uh, the policy is, is that Windows is not allowed in their environment because they essentially allow you to go and purchase your own machine. So you can go buy a Mac, you can go buy a machine preloaded with Linux, or buy a machine with Windows and then put Linux on it. You cannot run Windows, especially Windows Home. Now that I understand, that's a that's a different story. I've been in this space for a long time. I participated as as far as I know as one of the largest migrations of Windows to Linux on the desktop ever attempted in an enterprise, excluding government. Munich is probably larger. Uh, there's probably other larger deployments, but. That as far as I know, this is the this was the largest corporate migration. Put it mildly, it wasn't easy, and I actually think at the time there was a golden opportunity to go after that. Windows Vista was coming out, and it was a total dumpster fire from a compatibility standpoint with Windows XP applications. But there were lots of roadblocks that hindered it, that prevented it from from being successful. Today, we have a new opportunity. I personally think it's kind of passed. Everyone's just uh, accepted that they're going to have to get uh, TPM. And in the corporate world, they've already adopted it. Neil, Bill, what what do you think on, on that uh, article? And, and there have been subsequent 
discussion since. From reading the Register article, I think it's a... Having actually tried to do this a couple of times now, not necessarily at large scale, but at smaller scale companies, it's kind of hard to do if you don't design your IT from the beginning to account for Linux, or if you don't have a provider helping you build out that, that Linux-based IT. There are a number of like fundamental choices you have to make to make a Linux-first environment really work. And a lot of companies don't grok that. When they start looking at a Linux migration, this comes up as a roadblock, and then it just kind of falls apart from there. That being said, the time of 20 years ago and now, some of those larger failed migration attempts back then versus now, I think there's one big difference that we've had that actually puts it in our favor a little bit, and that is prevalence of web-based applications for modern workflows. I don't necessarily love the fact that a lot of corporate applications are now Electron apps, but one upside to all of that is that it all just works on all the platforms. You can kvetch at your vendor. If they're not already offering it to you, if it's an Electron-based app, you can kvetch at them to make them do it. It won't actually be that difficult for them to support it. Because of that, we just see an explosion of corporate apps that actually do work out of the box on Linux. And that sort of reinvigorated this ability for enterprises to support Linux for business workflows. Like we, we see that, uh, you know, customers, you know, like I, I've heard through unmentioned parties that part of the reason that we're now starting to see more Linux preloads is because enterprises are literally asking for them to be sold that way. And, and I think that's a very good positive point. And on the consumer side, we're seeing Proton become good enough, or sorry, Wine be good enough with the addition of the Proton enhancements to be able to run some of the most complex applications that are actually made for the Windows platform. And that's video games. Most people wouldn't think of it, but video games are probably the most difficult Windows applications to emulate. They touch every subsystem and do all kinds of wacky things in the name of performance. At one point, this is like in 2005, 2006, actually, there, I actually felt like there were more games that worked on Linux and Wine than today, like in terms of like the overall catalog. Uh, one of the big showcases was is, uh, uh, that World of Warcraft worked out of the box on a Wine proprietary fork called Sedega, if you remember Sedega from way back in the day. And... Also, part of this migration was using that I participated in was using crossover from Code Weavers to deploy Microsoft Office. And even today, Microsoft Office in crossover or in any other wine distribution is a hot mess. Doesn't matter. It was crap back in 2005. It's crap today. So I, if that's like part of the table stakes that Microsoft Office must be part of this migration, and I'm talking not just the web. I don't care what anyone says. The web version of Microsoft Office is different. I've had compatibility issues with PowerPoint, sharing uh, documents with uh, customers and partners. There, there's no way it's uh, the same. Anyway, that's a, a bit of a tangent. Also, Neil, like a lot of the apps I was that were huge roadblocks back in 2005, I don't think we have this now as much, but it was what they were web apps that were roadblocks. And it was because of dependencies on Internet Explorer. Is there that possibility that we're heading into this freight train with Chrome and Microsoft Edge, where it only work on a specific version of Edge or Chrome? I don't think so. The Edge and Chrome thing is more of a you know, it's still all Chromium. Microsoft, with Edge, makes a Linux version available. They even make Xbox Game Pass available through through Edge on Linux. We don't have applications directly doing things to the operating system anymore like we used to. Like We don't have Java applets or ActiveX controls and all these other things that really, really made things difficult, you know, 20 years ago. HTML5 and like just beefing up the the browser as an a, an abstraction layer 
has become the go-to strategy for the last several years. Every time someone says there's not enough and uh, to, to make things work, the answer hasn't been, let's extend the browser to punch a hole through. It's let's extend the browser to build an abstraction. That in itself has made web applications much more versatile, but also made them much more portable. Bill, in the small business space, is that the case? I mean, you're more in the small business space than I am. Is it still, is it all web-based now? Could a, could a small business with or without their knowledge start using a Linux device? Well, actually, actually, that's a great, great way to put it. Could you throw a Linux machine in front of a user and would they even know it? Most of the small businesses that I work with are Microsoft shops because they're of the adage that nobody ever got fired for buying Microsoft. But what I find really interesting is that as these younger business leaders emerge, that whole mantra of buy Microsoft or else is gone. These young entrepreneurs and business people grew up with Google, many of them. And so to them, a device is just a means to an end. You could throw any particular device at them and they're comfortable with the UI. So I actually think in the small business space, it's easier to put a Linux system in front of a user and say, okay, go get your work done. Well, can I log into Salesforce? Sure. Can I get my email? Sure. Can I get to my HR applications? Sure. Great. I'm ready to go. There, there's less of the application pitfalls you might see in a larger enterprise. You know, in a smaller business, maybe they don't need Outlook. Maybe they're happy with a web app. But in the larger enterprise, especially in the C-suite, they're used to their Outlook and that's what they want to use. So we have to work around that. Ah, but here's an important point. That's not a function of whether the enterprise is small or large. That's a function of the makeup of the people in the enterprise, right? Like, for example, I know of a, a fairly large-ish enterprise that, uh, you know, has multiple thousands of people that doesn't use Microsoft 365 at all. They don't use Outlook. They don't use Office. And they also fully support Linux. They encourage it. They built it into their workflows. This is where I come back to. It's actually a function of the IT solutions you're picking and the philosophy around your IT. Because when you, when you are thinking about these platforms and you're thinking about how you want to support them, you make different choices. I, I personally am starting to like have this write-up of like, if you want to be a Linux first company, these are the kinds of IT choices you should make because I am now, I am very experienced in all of the potential options that a company can pick. And I've seen the upsides and downsides of all of them. We actually started to explore this at one of our schools recently where the board of ed expressed a concern regarding Google and their privacy policy that they found online. Now, granted, they're looking at a consumer version of the Google policy and brought that to the attention of the board, but I was tasked with finding an alternative. And so I said, you know, you could always explore Microsoft Office. And their response to that was, well, that means the machines are going to cost more for the students because Windows obviously has a higher overhead than Chrome. And I said, well, what if I told you there was a third solution? You could put any device in front of a student, call it a $200 refurbished laptop from name your reseller or vendor, and I could connect you to your data locally that you would own on a NAS, and it doesn't matter what device you're using. And they were very interested in exploring that idea until the building leadership changed and they wanted to move to an all Google solution instead. But I think there is a means and a space to do that. As you said, Neil, making sure that your IT is structured correctly to support Linux out of the box. Because hiring in Microsoft-focused IT professionals to your organization is not going to put you in that, that space where you need to be to introduce Linux to your users. Absolutely. When you look at this space, one of the other concerns that people have is things like device management. Mass device management is a solution that dogs everyone. It doesn't really matter what platform we're talking about. This is hard, but it's especially challenging on Linux because 
the solutions are not as well known. The options out there are not broadly available. The problem with device management on Linux is it's niche. So it's already hard. You, and usually when they, they, you do find one, it's incomplete. So it won't be able to handle remote wipe, for example. Like that's become table stakes. Can I do remote wipe on a, on a machine? A few years ago, that was not table stake. If Windows, I, I actually do think uh, that was not a requirement. It'd be easy, be super easy to get done from a device management perspective. But remote wipe is immediately first thing that's asked when discussing this, can you do it? And usually the answer is no. Even if the drive is encrypted, you still want to try to nuke the data nonetheless. I think a huge part of that is how, why it's so difficult is how encryption on Linux is done. Neil and I had conversations about this just one-on-one. It's something that needs to get solved to drive that adoption. Because right now, the only way to handle this is to either use a Microsoft device, Chromebook, or a Mac. Because all three of those, there are plenty of device management solutions that can do that. And it's because it's a well-known, (laughs) well-easy to uh, accomplish task. Relatively easy in comparison to Linux. Because in order for it to get a connection when it boots to the internet, you have to know the encryption key. But maybe that's a good thing. I don't know. I really don't know how uh, what, what the answer is there. I actually think that while that is obviously, like, part of that is, is definitely based on, I think it's on the wrong direction. One thing that Linux doesn't have currently, currently, that Windows and Mac do, is that they can re-encrypt the drive while the system is online. And that makes provisioning machines and delivering them to users very easy because you don't have to do anything. And on first login, when they connect to your corporate resources system, that's when the encryption kicks in and that's when the policies take effect. Like, if you do a Windows provisioning, that laptop goes out unencrypted because it's got nothing on it and nobody cares. But once you log in, it uses your your credentials as a seed to communicate with your 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 policy system and trigger BitLocker, or in the case of, of Mac OS, File Vault. And in the Linux land, because we've had a predilection towards overly centralized architectures for um, for for deployments, and what I mean by that is we're mostly doing servers in data centers with controlled in ingress and egress. It is very easy to ignore this problem because you're also just reprovisioning machines pretty much automatically with controlled mechanisms where keys can be centrally managed and all that fun stuff in a very easy to route mechanism. So like, for example, with RHEL, you'd use a kickstart, you'd have it connected to a Clevis and Tang server that exists in your data center, and it would go through the process of actually setting everything up, keying it automatically inside the DC. But when you talk about laptops or desktops, and especially ones that ex- exist outside of the, the literal physical walls of a facility, that gets harder. We're we're starting to see the beginnings of technologies that can that can help solve this problem. So, for example, Brandon, you know that I follow the Butterfest stuff very closely. Very, very recently, as in within I don't know, I think the past month or so, the patch set for adding a, a proposed patch set has been submitted to add native encryption, native volume encryption to Butterfs. This goes through the FSCrypt subsystem that's in Linux, which means everything fully understands how to work with it. You can integrate whatever security policies that you like. You can also use whatever crypto policies you like, for example, FIPS, if you're in a in an environment that requires it, and things of that nature. Then the other piece that ma- that's on the the other piece on the that matters is the key management. FSCrypt is pluggable. You can put whatever you like. So then your device management solution would just plug into that and do it properly in the same way that, you know, you would do it with Windows with, um, uh, what's it called? Intune, I think is it. And then, or, and for Jamf for Mac OS. So Neil, I, this is something you and I had discussed and like, we came up with some wacky ideas. Yeah. uh, To to solve this. (laughs) There are, there are some crazy ways to try to do, to do this. Assuming you're utilizing, ButterFS, 
could I boot into a system without needing an encryption key, the encryption key, and then be able to just log it, you know, get to say GDM, log in, and then it decrypts my the rest of my drive. Yeah, the ButterFS native encryption can be done at a sub volume level, even. So you could you could do it at a full volume level, sub volume level, files, folders, uh, whatever level of encryption you'd like to do. More importantly, you will also be able to do backups using ButterFS send and receive without decrypting anything. So everything transmits encrypted, everything stored encrypted. That's a new level of of capability that doesn't exist in any existing architecture today that I'm aware of. Bill, you do a lot more with this stuff. You can tell me if I'm wrong here on this front, but I don't I'm not aware of anything on the other platforms that actually does something like this. No, it's not in the design of that particular architecture. I mean, really the two big MDMs out there, as you said, are Intune from Microsoft and Jamf, and there's many other uh, variants out there. Ironically enough, there's really not a good MDM for Android. I've looked around, I've tried a few, and they're just not there. They're very limited. The BlackBerry one from long ago, I don't know if they, I don't know if BlackBerry still makes it, but the MDM that those guys made uh, years ago that I tried was actually pretty decent. Good technologies. I think they acquired that. That, yeah. Is that the one you're thinking of? Yeah, I think oh, I was so. going back to the days of the old BlackBerry Enterprise server. My old buddy, the Bez. Well, when they first started making Android phones, they ported their um, the Bez and the Biz architectures to actually integrate with Android. And so you could do MDM for Android using the BlackBerry Enterprise server. Yeah, there, there are a few open source solutions to manage Android. I'll actually, I'll put them in the show notes and Bill will send them to you as well. Like they, I have looked into them pretty, uh, God, they were, I, they're still going, but I looked into them is several years ago now, but I've kept tabs on at least one of them and it looked, and uh, that one's pretty widely used uh, across the globe there. It's not, it's not a, it's not as niche as, uh, people would think it is an open source Android uh, MDM. It's actually pretty widely used. And I think with MDM with Linux, you're going to have to have some sort of partnership with a major least supported distribution, whether that's Ubuntu, Red Hat, SUSE. But I can just see it becoming a real challenge if your users are coming in saying, well, I need this device running Mint or Gentoo or Arch to be enrolled in the MDM and have that go well. Oh, they, no, they, they get, they get two choices. They get Rel or Fedora. That's it. No, no you don't need any. <laughs> no, nothing else. Nothing else at all. Not even Sousa. No Sousa. No Sousa at all. <laughs> nope. I, okay, then. All right. <laughs> I don't. I don't want to put the. I don't want to like poke the Ubuntu bear either. I'm kidding. I'm. I. I gotta troll people. It's yeah. Uh, got got to bring back the distro wars. Distro wars sure. are fun. All right, yeah, 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 yeah. We can definitely we're... do distro wars if that's what you want. But more seriously, we're looking at right now. You, if you look at the landscape, pun intended, um, there's actually a fair number of Linux device management solutions out there. The problem is that most of them are not. The internet's going to hate this. There aren't a lot of SaaS-based ones, not a lot of cloud-based ones that work where you operate on the assumption that the devices are outside of your, your borders, your perimeter. And that's, that's actually the, the big problem we have right now. Linux is now just starting to be put into these kinds of environments, and the solutions are going to naturally start cropping up from here. This is probably you know opportunities for people to like make solutions and, and, and build a market around it. There's an interview I haven't published yet, but I'll probably try to get it together in the coming weeks, depending on how the audio turned out. I was traveling for that interview, so I don't recall what the how the audio turned out. This, one of the big solutions out there right now uh, for at least general management, it's not what I would describe as an MDM, it's a component. And that's Fleet DM, which is uh, essentially a front end for OS query that can help you at least help you enforce policies, right? Like, for example, disk encryption. So is your disk encrypted? And it works across all the major platforms. Works on Linux, works on Windows, and it works on Mac. 
So it is uh, BitLocker enabled, or is or is Lux on the volume on the specifically? Let's just say the home volume. Maybe it needs to be on others, you know, like logs, etc. Right now, as far as I as far as I know, is the only solution out there, as you described it, Neil. Is it's SaaS or it's on prem? Depends. It's up to you. But that's the the only system out there I can think of that that can do that from from a Linux perspective. I'll go back to the small business for a second because usually in small business, MDM requirements are a lot less. You don't have the compliance overhead and all the restrictions and rules and policies of a large company. So I actually think the small business is better suited for device management, even if just at scale, than a large corporation is to roll out Linux to their users. In terms of that type of a rollout, though, even if it's small, most small businesses, at least the ones that I've dealt with, they don't want the hardware overhead. I don't deal with them at that much these days, but I have occasionally talked to former clients of mine and they only want SaaS solutions or fully managed at the very minimum. But they don't want to deal with hardware. They don't want to deal with anything. They just want something that that, that uh, they can have their nephew log into and uh, be able to manage a, a device. <laughs> There's a couple of others in this space that actually fit in this. And and interestingly enough, a lot of them also use OS Query underneath, which shows the strength of OS Query as a tool. OS Query is wicked awesome. Yeah, it's very good. You know, the MDM part, but the other part of this is your collaboration stack. We alluded to this earlier when we talked about Microsoft Office and, and Web Office and whatever. In a modern enterprise, man, I can't even say that phrase without like hurting myself a little in, in in the contemporary enterprise it is very common it is very common expectation that people are able to share and collaborate and do real-time document development whether that's making the next presentation to make the next sale or to write up the next uh, the next report about you know what you need to do next in the next quarter got to collaborate on the tps reports oh i really didn't want you to say that but all right here we go but yeah basically like People people expect to have real time collaboration capabilities, and people also expect those uh, those collaborative capabilities to be high fidelity. That means that you got to look at your options out there for for this. And the two big ones everyone knows are Google Workspace, formerly known as Google uh, G Suite, formerly known as Google Apps for your domain, and Microsoft three sixty five, formerly known as Office three sixty five. These two solutions basically slice you right down the middle. Microsoft's solution gives you just enough web to augment the desktop applications. They really prefer you use those desktop applications. Google is all in on the web. And actually, they kind of created the whole real-time collaborative model in the first place. And they're still first class at this. I have experienced both. And I will say that between the two, I would definitely pick Google over Microsoft when it comes to to this, not just be, not because of features or whatever, because from a pure feature perspective, you're going to have more with Microsoft Office because the desktop apps can just do more. If your primary goal is to support each other, to be able to work together to do something quickly and efficiently, in my experience, the Google stack is way better at this. Um, not to mention for a small business or even in a large enterprise, the Google Identity Provider stack is way better and way more supported and way easier to work with than than a lot of the alternatives. We just talked about two very large, that's a, big ones. It, that's an it depends, Neil. Like, yes, yes, I know. I, yeah, I, I'm I've talking about SaaS, yeah. SaaS based yeah. ones. Of the SaaS yeah. based ones, um, I, I think that that's that's a no brainer between them. Um, but if you if you're looking at Maybe your enterprise wants to be a little bit more flexible. Maybe you have data data restrictions and things like that. Then you probably need to look more towards a more hybrid on-prem kind of solution. And like things like Red Hat Single Sign-On, otherwise known as the Keycloak Project, that one's a very phenomenal IDP, uh, identity provider solution that works great for pretty much anyone. It's pretty much considered the gold standard of IDPs for anyone who is not using Google Period. Like I would even say, I would go so far to say, 
if you're one of those unfortunate souls using Microsoft 365, configure Microsoft 365 to bounce you to Key Cloak, a Key Cloak deployment, because you're going to have a better SSO experience with Key Cloak than you are with Microsoft directly. But so, then the, sorry, uh, so. I need to complete this thought, otherwise I'm going to lose it. <laughs> um, but then, of course, we want to talk about like the, the groupware suite, the collaboration stuff. A lot of people want web-based stuff, but they sometimes also want the desktop stuff, and that makes it tricky. There aren't a lot of solutions out there that are available for Windows, Mac, and Linux. Just a few weeks ago, I was looking into this, and there is actually one that could be pretty good, especially in the small business space, but it could also scale up quite well in the large enterprise. I don't know. Uh, it's something people should, maybe Brandon what, what Billy is should look at. Only Office, the Only Office workspace stuff. Only Office Workspace is interesting. I, I thought about it. You know, before we d I dive into that, though, I just want to say I've used both. I use G Suite all the time, and I use uh, Microsoft Office to collaborate with uh, partners all the time. We even do real-time collab. What I like about Microsoft Office is I can do real-time collaboration inside of the actual real Microsoft Word. I don't have to use a web client. I can use Microsoft Word and do real-time collaboration inside of Word. I don't I get that with Google. I have to I have to have I have to use Chrome. I have to have yet another Chrome tab open. I actually looked at it the other day. I had Chrome I was using Chromium. It was I have 128 gigs of RAM in my workstation here at home. It was using about half of that. <laughs> so <laughs> Because Chrome is you know, memory hog, and I was I didn't have a lot of tabs open, but that's a like web apps are now bigger and fatter than. Um, that's why I, I I don't. That's why I go. Is are we sure that this is the right opportunity, even with a web app for everything? That's why that that's my thesis. I don't I don't know if it is. I'm not saying that web apps are the right strategy or even a good thing in general. I'm saying that's where things are going, no matter how I feel about it. I might as well reap some of the benefits of the fact that we're going down this downward spiral of everything running in a web app. Well, we've always talked about, even in the Linux community, having package standardization. What we got out of it in the end, whether we liked it or not, was, sure, we'll standardize all your apps. We're just going to standardize them all as Electron apps instead. And I think Apple actually had a big part in moving applications to Electron-based systems. I don't know about that. Microsoft more so than Apple. Apple wants everything as a Swift app to run on iOS and Mac. They they don't want they don't want they don't want that. But it's the catalyst that causes the change to put us where we are now. Well, I think a big, big portion of that was the uh, with uh, iOS when uh, Steve Jobs said. Everyone has a, the language for an iPhone. It's called HTML5. I remember that. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. And then uh, what? It was. I don't even think it was a year later. You had the capability of writing apps in C Sharp. Not C Sharp, in uh, Objective-C. And then uh, actually, and th eventually you could use C Sharp with... Uh, uh, um, and then, uh, and now Swift, you know, now you can write in any language for iOS, as long as it can be interpreted, uh, down at the, uh, with objective C, that's really all that matters. And from my understanding, I haven't looked at iOS in development in probably eight, nine years. So I don't know a lot about it. A big thing that changed in the in, in the iOS space uh, a few years ago, I forget whether it was like three or four or five years ago, was that they changed to applications don't get compiled to machine code anymore. They get compiled to LLVMIR. And the LLVMIR is what you upload into the App Store. And then Apple compiles it for you to machine code for all the architectures. That's also what allows them to bring up a new platform and just have all the apps ready native for iOS. And I think they started pushing this model for Mac apps too. Because Mac apps are now essentially uh, no different than an iOS app, especially with uh, every system now being based on uh, uh, on an Apple chip. It, essentially now Mac OS is just iOS with uh, uh, the ability to use a mouse. 
to the ability to have a menu bar because you that can too. use a mouse on an iPad. Uh, yeah, oh, and a menu bar with uh, with a notch. Got to have the notch. Right, the no- got to remember the notch. The notch is there. It loves you. I mean, you still even have a dock in iOS and Mac OS. Uh, you do. The dock is still there. The, 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 the key difference between iOS and Mac OS from a UX perspective right now is the menu bar. Everything else is pretty much the same now, which is weird to think about. Like, you can even have windowed applications in iPad now. Yeah. So. Yeah, starting with the uh, iPad OS 16 or whatever it is. But anyway, I. We digress. Um, Not really, because if you think about it, this leads to a good point. I have one company that is worldwide. There's about probably 30, 40 employees, and all of them carry around an iPad Pro. That is their only device. That's literally the only device they have. They're a multimedia production company. I mean, their their rendering equipment is obviously physical max, but the people that actually do their work are doing them on the 12 and a half inch iPad Pros. And it's amazing to actually watch how they work on a tablet device and be as productive as they are. That's all they've ever known. That's They don't know laptops. They don't know Windows. They don't know Chrome OS. They just know they get to their mail. They send and receive mail, they upload files to their drive, and they go on to the next task in their list. I'm going to echo on your mail, expand on mail. So one of the reasons why I carry around an iPad when I travel is offline mail. I do have offline mail on my laptop. I I use uh, Evolution to connect to Google. That is my biggest complaint about web apps. Yeah, I know I can do offline mail. Someone's going to say you can do offline mail on a, in Chrome with Google, but it's like I can get like a month of my mail locally. If I need to search for something that happened more than a month ago, it might be 90 days, but still I've had, I've been in situations where I was using that and I had to search for something and I couldn't find it. I had to wait till I landed and that's just not okay. And the other thing is you know, one of the reasons why I also think that something like an only office or or even using a Microsoft suite over Google, being able to do local editing, be able to do those updates. That's one of the biggest problems I have with Google. I agree with you. That's a pain. I cannot I cannot do any work on a plane. Yeah. If it's no, a you're right. Doc. You're right. And that actually might be a positive point for using only office uh, because uh, so only office is totally open source, totally free to use and whatever. I'm sure Brandon will throw it in the show notes so that people can check it out. But the cool thing is that in addition to only office, having a SAS and a cloud and a self-hosted web version, there are also n- desktop applications and they can integrate with your choice of cloud locker file locker storage. So you could use Google drive, you can use OneDrive or whatever. And, and plug that all in together. That's also with the web-based stuff. Like only Office Workspace could plug into Google Drive and you could use that as your mechanism for uh, doing uh, advanced document stuff that normally you can't do with docs and sheets and slides and whatever. And then those things can sync down to the desktop applications and you can do that full workflow of things. From a feature set perspective, while it's not totally perfect, I've poked, poked around a little bit with only Office. It seems to be at parity with the Microsoft applications when it comes to fidelity with Microsoft document formats. Um, it even seems to handle super complicated Excel sh- documents that I really wish it didn't handle. It's going back to my experience from 2005. One of the problems, one of the, actually this was the, the this was other than the Internet Explorer only applications like PeopleSoft at the time, PeopleSoft only worked in Internet Explorer. But the other one was OpenOffice. At the time, LibreOffice was not a thing. It was OpenOffice. Uh, OpenOffice 2 had just been released and it did not support pivot tables and it could not support uh, sheets with more than, I think it was 100,000 rows. Maybe it was more than that. I don't remember the exact number. There are sheets out there, Excel spreadsheets out there that are like 
millions of rows. And Excel handles it no problem. And only Office I know supports it completely. So you can do a Google, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, an Excel spreadsheet in only Office has over a million rows and I'll handle it. I know that there are some features that are missing, but it has pivot tables. <laughs> so. It even supports VBA. And that hurt me when I found that out. That was uh, what, what part of my job <laughs> in 2005 was porting VBA to Open Basic, which is the scripting language for LibreOffice and OpenOffice. That was fun. By fun, I mean not fun. This is where I go and say, if Microsoft Document Fidelity matters to you and you still want to have a first-class Linux experience, whatever platform you're picking, use only Office along with it because it will work. And the workflow is similar enough to a modern Microsoft Office experience. Uh, most users probably won't even notice the difference. Yeah, absolutely. They may just assume uh, only Office is the new name for Microsoft Office. <laughs> they may assume that. Well, it, the average task worker, right? Yeah. Not, like an Excel power user is going to go, what the hell is this? The average task worker won't, won't notice the difference. And another thing for only Office is that, again, like I said earlier, you can combine it with whatever collaboration suite you want to use. Like in my dream scenario... I'd probably set up Google and pair it with OnlyOffice and do it that way because you get the strong security privacy. And I know what our listeners are thinking, Google and privacy. When you are using Google Workspace, it is a completely different world. I have worked for companies using both. And I can tell you right now that from my experience, Google Workspace is more secure, more reliable, and more performant than Microsoft 365. And I would go as so far as to say that because of the nature of the Google identity system being what it is, a lot of corporate applications, a lot of standard IT applications, and a lot of third-party solutions tend to have a straightforward integration to a corporate Google account way before anything else. It has become a new de facto standard for being able to integrate corporate systems and solutions. And so you are really hurting yourself when you don't have a Google account as a corporate system. Even if you choose to use Microsoft 365, you can set up a Google Workspace free identity cloud account system, bind it to your Microsoft system, and use it so that you have a Google account associated with your Microsoft account. And that you should always, always, always make sure you have a Google account because you will be surprised at how many things just only support Google single sign-on. And you will want to have that piece. We started rolling out GCPW at our schools and bypassing Active Directory because for the few Windows machines that exist in a school nowadays, why do I need to have domain controller and a managed print server? Google Admin has the capabilities to manage most modern printers. And GCPW allows me to authenticate users to Google directory services on a Windows system. So the user simply control alt delete, sign in as other user, enter their Google email address and password, and they're signed in, which is nice because it automatically signs them into Chrome and all their other Chrome based apps with that single sign on mechanism that you mentioned prior, Neil. And there's also equivalents for Linux, too. There are PAM modules for using Google Auth to log in. With things like GNOME online accounts for KDE, you have K accounts. You can sign into your Google account and propagate the Google se the login session to all your applications and services and your web browsers. And things just work. And that's, that's phenomenal. Yeah, that's how I set up uh, Google is using GNOME online account. Fully configures evolution or if you prefer Geary, and uh, you still... Actually, the latest release of GNOME Calendar actually might be useful now that it has an agenda view, finally. About time. Well, Neil uses Kmail, so it doesn't matter anyway. I, I, I want to go back to part of the premise of the article, in, is that Windows is just a security nightmare. Windows Home, probably. I don't know enough about Windows Home. There's enough tools now in place and like you don't other than the occasional ransomware issue i haven't heard of a major 
vulnerability or virus or whatever impacts uh, someone day to day in a modern Windows environment. I mean, essentially every other week you reinstalled Windows uh, when I was using it just because that's, I, I, I was essentially trained, I trained myself to do that. Just, I don't know, it always felt like something was slowing it down or whatever, but probably not a virus in my case, but I haven't used Windows since Windows 2000. In, in, a, in a contemporary in contemporary enterprise, when it comes to Windows, the problem with Windows isn't, it goes too far in one direction or the other when it comes to security. So like if you have a fully managed Windows environment, a company may choose A, to have a fully managed without local privileges for a Windows environment. And that actually makes it super difficult to use whole classes of applications or use certain capabilities and features. So the pendulum has to swing the other way where, you know, users have to wind up being admins again. And that just invites all kinds of chaos in terms of actually managing machines uh, in flight. Now, there can be happy middle grounds, but you have to like do a deep analysis and, and, and structured maintenance. And it's a lot of work to actually do that properly. And so a big part of the problem with like doing Windows properly at scale is that you actually have to have the staff to like understand the full gamut of use cases and distill them down into GPOs or Ansible or whatever mechanism you're using to maintain these systems. That's because Windows applications over the past 20-ish years still haven't adapted to privilege separation. I was just remembering, I was managing some Windows 2000 boxes. I think it was still an XP. I do remember if you were a standard user, you essentially could run Microsoft Office. If you wanted to do anything else, uh, you needed to have higher a higher privilege. But there was this in between that could run most apps, and that was Power User. As far as I'm aware, that's not a thing anymore. The Power User privilege. The Power User privilege still exists, but doesn't do anything. They can't remove privileges, pr privilege levels like that, without breaking everything. So it's still there, but. I don't know of a, a, a of a modern configuration that uses it anymore, uh, and and in Windows, at least with Windows 10, um, I haven't seen it configured to do anything out of the box. It, it, it's pretty much a standard user with like one or two extra pop settings. My Windows experience is twenty years out of date. I I haven't touched Windows uh, in a professional manner in that long i have to ask the stupid questions when it comes to windows <laughs> well bill here probably could tell us a little bit more because he does more of this than either of us do yeah the microsoft world is the world i live in every day as a managed services provider so i am quite familiar with how windows works and yes the power users group is there for legacy purposes but it's no longer de facto permission that is applied regularly. Probably a holdover from Windows 2000. Actually from NT4. That's where it came from. Essentially, at this point, it's a permissions problem. And when, maybe just Windows is being stupid uh, when it comes to handling elevated privileges. That's what it sounded like from what Neil was saying. It's an ecosystem problem, not necessarily a Windows problem. Applications haven't had a reason to change because Windows for regular users is still users being provisioned as admins by default. Most of the Windows ecosystem is built around that consumer Windows experience. And the corporate Windows experience like tends to vary wildly. So it's not easy to like define what you should expect. And in most corporate environments, you tend to change the way Windows behaves based on what tools you're using, rather than setting your policies and Windows to what you want it to be and forcing the tools to fix themselves. I think we kind of more or less addressed it. I don't think we answered the question, but I think we're at that, you know, we can safely say, could businesses drop Windows for Linux? The answer is maybe. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it would, it, we could do like, I don't know, maybe we could do some kind of lab thing where we actually prototype a business deployment that would be Linux friendly. That would be some interesting things that would be worth doing. We can make that happen, Neil. You and I can make that happen here. Probably, yeah. I just uh, recorded a video about my new hardware. Be posting that. If it hasn't posted already, uh, it'll be on the Pseudo Show YouTube channel. So but I'll be uh, putting together a prototype I, I have in mind, which 
is essentially a combination of, uh, I think, three tools. GNOME Fleet Commander, uh, Fleet Device Management, which is uh, what I mentioned earlier with o- uh, that utilizes OS Query, coupled with uh, Catello Foreman, so for package management. Like that it was the three major pieces in the room of open source technology that solves most of the use cases. I'm sure there's other things, but those are the ones I'm most familiar with. As far as I'm aware, there's really no other tools that can uh, that that tick all the boxes. So it's like Foreman can handle the automation, the packages, some level of policy, not a lot. Most of the policy would be handled by Fleet DM and then triggering Ansible plays or Puppet, whatever it is, whatever end up using. And then a, a Fleet Commander would enforce like the general desktop policy of what you can actually do in chain. Uh, I would actually stack on top of this, probably figuring out what kind of collaboration stack you want to plug with this. If we're going all open source, it'd probably be worth looking at how does only office plug into this picture too. But if we want to look at a more realistic corporate environment, probably like what Google and Microsoft both look like. Spoiler alert, Microsoft's not super awesome. I think we should do that and model out what it looks like and what the user experience is like. Because I think that is that is the key for making businesses want to do it. Because they, they have to feel comfortable with it. Needs to work with the existing tooling. It needs to work with Azure AD. Right. It needs to work with Google Auth. Something like that. There's a whole there's a whole built in model here of things that you could show off to show what a theoretical Linux environment, a business Linux business environment looks like. We're going to collaborate on that. We'll put, we'll put something together. I don't know what that will look like yet. Either a write up, maybe some sort of white paper, YouTube video. I think that would be uh, something we, we could pull together in the next few weeks, you know, collaborate. I have a, I just uh, finished building a only office workspaces instance, uh, so we, that's where we'll start it. Sure, yeah. I assume you built it in the lovely open shifts. Nope, it's virtualized. No. Oh, you did it the plain way. I thought you would have gone all crazy fancy and whatever. Oh, uh, how's this? I'll, I'll, I'll make a use out of a micro shift. I'll, I'll deploy it on micro oh. shift. Oh, there we go. There we go. We got to get them Kubernetes in there. Bill, Neil, thank you for taking the time today. I, I know this one was a bit of a last minute thing. I just wanted to get thoughts out there and talk about this. Like I I feel like I haven't talked to you guys in weeks. Um, it has been weeks. I've been sick and busy, probably, and also busy and sick. <laughs> so, <laughs> busy being sick. Yeah, I do appreciate uh, you guys getting on with me again, and we'll be getting together again, probably you know, uh, next week to talk about this uh, solution and start whiteboarding it out. Maybe do something live. That'd be fun. That sounds like fun. Head on over to the Pseudo Show YouTube channel, pseudo.show slash YouTube, and make sure to get subscribed for all the great content that is coming up. And head on over to tuxdigital.com for ways to engage in the conversation, whether that's on the forum or on Discord. Thank you for listening to the Pseudo Show podcast, where business meets open source. Until next time.